This is the Free Hill Life Podcast, episode number 111. I'm your host, Josh Madsen, coming at you from the Free Hill Life shop in Salt Lake City, Utah. Happy Monday, Free Hill Lifers. We're back in action. It's another week, and hopefully you got some skiing in this past weekend, as always. And uh, good to be back. Stoked for another week. And, of course, I'm stoked for another episode. So, uh... I guess uh, first thing is I hope you enjoyed last week's podcast with Arno Klein, a fantastic gentleman from Austria, ski historian, and a wealth of knowledge. I had a really great time talking to him. Hopefully you enjoyed it as well. And I've got another amazing guest coming up next week, my good friend, Todd Stewart. So if any of you were telemarkers back in the mid-2000s and you saw the original PW05 from the Powder Whores. Uh, Todd Stewart is the gentleman who lived in a hut for many, many years. And we had a good conversation and it was good to catch up with him. He's uh, He's been a good friend of mine all the way back since we met in that original movie. So I hope you'll check that out and be sure to uh, subscribe to the podcast wherever you listen to it so you can make sure not to miss any episodes. They drop every Monday morning, and uh, you can catch up on all the news, culture, history, (laughs) and whatnot. So thanks for always listening. I really appreciate that, and I hope you've enjoyed these last couple episodes. It's been fun getting some guests back on and digging in. So, what's going on in the world of Telemark right now? Quite a bit, actually. Um, Mostly just going to go over news about the events. Uh, Like I said the past couple weeks, this is really when things start to turn on, generally speaking. And people start doing events at their local mountains. And, of course, this is one of the most important things, in my opinion. It gets local communities together together for gatherings, clinics, and I think it's just a great way to help grow the sport. So this Saturday, this is for uh, all of those of you who are near Pine Knob, Michigan. January 15th, Free Heel Life Midwest is teaming up with Motor City Telly for a Telemark Demo Day. So be sure to get there and check that out. Then, The following weekend in Caberfay Peaks in Cadillac, Michigan, on January 22nd, we've got the Lower Peninsula Pinhead Reunion. You Midwesterners are getting after it, and I love it. So be sure to check that those uh, those two events out: January 15th, Pine Knob; January 22nd in Caberfay Peaks. And then going to the other side of the world on that same day, January 22nd. In Nozawa, Japan, We Telemark is putting on an event with clinics and a gathering there. So be sure to check that one out if you are in Japan. Coming back to the U.S. for February 26th and 27th in Vermont at Bromley, the 36th annual Corey Anderson Telemark Festival. And then following up on March 5th, everywhere in the world, World Telemark Day coming at you. Be sure to start setting your uh, uh, your meetups, where you're going to meet up with your Telemark friends at your local hill, and start sending me those when you got them. Podcast at FreeHillLife dot com. We're going to be putting a press release and the logo out here in the next few weeks, so stay tuned for that. Uh, Obviously, honestly, by the time this podcast comes out, we'll probably already have it and uh, available for you to use locally to get the word out for World Telemark Day. And then the last one I have is March 11th and 12th, Mad River Glen in Vermont, Free Heel Frolic. Always a stronghold on the East Coast of the United States and a fantastic place to ski if you have not skied Mad River Glen. So, That should uh, be great for all you East Coasters from Mass up to Vermont, New Hampshire, and even some of you Canadians if you want to come down for that. So 
that's what I got for uh, newsroom and notes today. And uh, hopefully you're living in one of those places where there's an event going on and you can meet up with some other freaky telemark skiers and do some knee dropping with each other. If you've got events that you want to get to me, like I keep saying, podcast at freehealife.com is the best place. Just send me a quick email with, with the details and I will put them up to make sure the rest of the free heal lifers that listen to this podcast know what's going on. So my guest today is from Connecticut on the East Coast of the United States. He originally started on snow via cross country gear, but it was through the original Backcountry and Coolar magazines uh, that he began to see some heavier cross country downhill gear in the late 1980s. And this sparked his interest and he started down the path of dropping knees. He's been a PSIA level three uh, instructor in Telemark since 2014, as well as an educational Telemark staff team member for the PSIA divisional clinic leader program. On top of all of those awesome credentials, he's the director of Telemark skiing at Bromley Mountain in Peru, Vermont. And it's the oldest Telemark school in North America. So please welcome to the podcast, Greg Paquin. All right, Greg, welcome to the Free Hill Life podcast. How you doing, man? Hey, Josh, how are you? Good. I'm good. S- stoked to have you representing the East Coast. I, uh, I don't think I've had as many East Coast guests as I should have this year, so <laughs> it's good to have you on. Oh, well, yeah. Thank you. Glad now, to be here. Yeah. So in, now you live where? Do you live in Vermont? I do not live in Vermont. I live in southern New England, so I am in eastern Connecticut, close to the ocean. Oh no way! Okay. Yeah. I know it. I that that was. I'm glad I asked you that because sometimes I always forget like people's home mountains. A lot of times, especially from. Uh, Connecticut or you know some of those zones you know people are going up up north you know into Vermont and New Hampshire a lot of times and uh yeah. I'm spoiled we live in the Wasatch it's like 40 minutes from 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 our place so we're kind of weak that way <laughs> yeah I like your home turf too yeah no for sure so so did you grow up in Connecticut then or are you, are you from the east coast originally Yes, I'm East Coast from Killingworth, Connecticut. I still live in the same woodsy rural town that I grew up in. Uh, you know, built my own house here, and that, yeah, and it's uh, you know, in, in two hours, I'm deep in to to southern Vermont. So it's uh, it's very accessible. Did you uh? Did you grow up skiing in Connecticut? Those are, uh, you know, people that listen to the podcast know that I like all the weird, obscure small resorts. So I think uh, S- Southington, if I remember right, and uh, Tomahawk, if it's still around. There's a couple in Connecticut that I have not been yeah. to. Uh, so I didn't grow up. Um, I grew up playing hockey. I was a hockey kid. Oh, cool. So always on, on edges. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> yeah. So I didn't. I didn't really start um, more. Well, and I never um, used alpine equipment in my life. Oh, really? So when you started skiing, it was right on Nordic stuff. Yeah, when I started uh, skiing, which was in <clears throat> you know in college years, and and uh, just looking for some exercise in the winter, I just found a pair of. Uh, Nordic skis and started to go going to Nordic centers and stuff like that and and uh, I quickly found that I couldn't down the trail so I started going through the woods and swacking around and bushwhacking around and stuff like that. <clears throat> Is that and, oh go ahead yeah keep going yeah so that's that's what I would do. Is it and is that kind of like what what kind of led you? to kind of come in contact with Telemark scheme for the first time or, or just go into those Nordic centers or what was the whole catalyst? Cause that's interesting that you didn't come from any sort of Alpine background and, and uh, yeah, I'm always well, curious how people came in contact with, with, with the old telly turn. 
Well, you know, so I played hockey for many years and I played in college and I was really good and, and, um, you know, but after, after engineering school, it was just like, uh, wasn't enough. The ice times were terrible, but so I kind of dropped hockey and, and, uh, <clears throat> and I've started, uh, Nordic skiing more. Um, but I, I came to telemark skiing by, you know, I think it was the old, older backcountry magazine or maybe even Kular magazine or something like that. And I started seeing some heavier Nordic gear, you know, the leather boots, car who skis, that kind of stuff. And, uh, so, so I drifted that way cause I wanted, I wanted a setup that was heavier and more robust cause I was, I knew I was going to get hurt on these flimsy, uh, Nordic boots and skis. So I, I said, well, started looking into heavier equipment and it just kept going from there. Yeah. So, so you're probably talking, I mean, you're probably talking eighties. I'm thinking, I mean, from this, from the sounds of what we might call heavier gear now versus, <laughs> versus, I mean, that is, that was robust gear back then. So is that, is that kind of the time frame we're talking? Yeah. It was like it was the late eighties that I started diving into it, gave up hockey and started the deli skiing. I'm starting to see more and more connections to hockey as I talk to folks. It's really interesting how many hockey players are actually really good telemark skiers. So, <laughs> well, yeah, it's all you know, being on edge and being free and all that. Yeah, no, for sure. Um, <clears throat> okay, so like, yeah, late '80s, you're getting into it. Are you? So, are you going? I guess when when do you move sort of from this more robust gear? in the late eighties, are you starting to go on piece to like to a resort or, or, or were you strictly kind of backcountry hiking around at that point? I was uh, backcountry hiking around and, you know, exploring into Vermont and New Hampshire and places that I've always gone hiking and stuff. But, but, um, you know, it's, as you know, I'm dealing with the, off piece snow, snow different snow types and conditions. It's it's tough work sometimes, and and I needed to really dial it in better. So I started going to the uh, the, the resorts to you know the on piece world and with alpine people that skied alpine. So it was always a struggle. Um, but so yeah, I started drifting into the you know in the early nineties going to the ski mountains and you know looking for uh people that you know follow people or um you know maybe take some lessons here and there but keep experimenting yeah did you did you kind of gravitate as you started kind of looking into the resort scene did you end up at any any one resort or were you just, just kind of going, you know, when you were going to resorts, were you just kind of checking out different spots? Well, um, I, I was searching for, uh, mountains that had telemark gear or people that skied telemark. And, you know, one of, one of my early places that I would, would go was Mad River Glen because they had a, a reputation for telemark skiing and, and, uh, so I started skiing there, although that's quite a long drive, but so make it a few days, but uh, I started going there and then, um, yeah, I did go to Bromley I knew telemark skiers were there and I even took a lesson with Corey Anderson, uh, maybe 28 years ago, 25 years ago, didn't really know who he was. Well, and that's kind of, and I mean, so Bromley's kind of been your home, ends up being sort of your home stomping grounds at, at some point, right? Like where you're primarily going. Yeah. Um, but I was still floating around and the skiing was expensive and it still is. And, and, uh, so, so I'm a civil engineer, structural engineer guy and, um, work, been working in that world for a long time and. But so there was a group of uh, friends that I had in that world that were all skiers and, and, uh, they got me hooked up in a kind of a club that would 
um, buy blocks of tickets and you buy a brick and one brick of tickets was you know one pass for every mountain in vermont oh wow and it's a really good deal and um could then we trade off mountains that we didn't really want to go to and double up or triple up on the mountains we liked and and uh so that that's what got me skiing all around vermont all the time was that opportunity <clears throat> What would you, here, here's a question for you. Cause I'm always curious. I, like I said, I like the small obscure places. Um, like through those experiences, you know, in buying these blocks of tickets, like <laughs> I don't know, now that I'm thinking about this question, I'm like, someone's going to get mad at me for asking this, but what do you think is the most underrated off the radar resort that is super cool in Vermont, New Hampshire that maybe people just don't think about, or is there one, that kind of sticks out during that exploration period? Yeah, there's a, there's a few, but um, I'd say the most obscure one and the most, the one that's, uh, was left behind was, um, not left behind, but, uh, but it is now, but it was Mount Escutney. Um, it's since closed and now it's just a recreational ski area where you have to skin up on your own power and ski down. Hmm. But that, that mountain, um, had a huge amount of telemark skiers around and all those guys would cut trails in the, in the summer months around that mountain. And, uh, so they had a, had a huge off piece following there. And, um, so that's kind of really where I grew up. Telly skiing was at, this Mount of Scutney and, and, uh, with all my buddies were there and they were all, they all changed from Alpine to Telly and every couple of years we're upgrading our equipment, a little bit wider skis now, heavier bindings, heavier boots, and eventually moving to plastic. <laughs> yeah. So you were kind of, I mean, getting in the late eighties, you're kind of like right in that transitionary period of like, sort of like heavier Nordic gear. And then, you know, obviously going into the plastic, I mean, with, with a lot of that scene at Escutney, like where people, was there any like resistance to the move on the, on, at least in kind of in that group you were hanging out with in terms of moving to plastic boots or what? what? Yeah, it was me. <laughs> I was, a, I was a holdout for a long time. Oh, nice. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, you know, I, I, I don't know. I started on, on the lace up leathers and then it went to big burly Arcos boots with race boots, plastic cuffs, as stiff as you could possibly get them in the, you know, <laughs> and they were heavy. Oh yeah. But, Those boots are super heavy. <laughs> <laughs> I know exactly the Arcos you're talking about because they were more, the Arcos you're talking about, I think are probably like the ones that were kind of like the Merrill super comp. It had that, Yep. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's essentially like a double boot <laughs> with the plastic cuff and. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? You know, oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah. So you, you know, we still would ski around and start seeing other telemark folks at other mountains, like you know, JP or Mad River and and Bromley and and uh, yeah. So you you you're a part of one community and you start looking in at other mountains, little communities of telemark skiers that they have and you start meeting more people and you then you start seeing more gear and seeing how people are progressing and moving on and that's you know giving you thoughts about upgrading your gear and oh uh, man i have a whole gear room of old telly stuff <laughs> yeah and that, well that like you said that leather it's hard i think that that's why that was that's funny you're a holdout because i think there was kind of like this I mean, for and I'll say ahead for good reason. People that knew the flex of leather and 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 how the boot flexed it, there was probably a little to be be desired in the original plastic boots in terms of mimicking that, you know. So yeah, you know, it's it's it is a hard it, for someone who never came from leather and transitioned. You know, it's it, I think that was kind of an probably an interesting time for sure for a lot of people. Yeah, it was. 
Well, but uh, we were having more fun. For sure. Yeah. <laughs> well, and you definitely had, I mean, even with those heavier boots, your skis were still pretty light, generally speaking. <laughs> I feel like it's the opposite situation now. Everybody's complaining that their boots are too heavy and the skis are light enough and it's kind of the, the reverse situation. So, yeah. Um, well, I'm still on 75 millimeter. Uh, I use, you know, Scott's uh, four buckle synergy and uh, vice bindings and and uh, vocal skis and Vazi skis, that kind of stuff. Oh, cool. That's it. That's a good question. So on your vice, um, on your vice bindings, are you still skiing them in, in the, in the first position, like a more neutral position? No, I'm in the second position. Okay. It's, you know, yeah, there's still a lot of power there. It's progressive. Um, I use heavy springs. Oh, you know, so you have sti- stiffy springs on too. Yep. Yeah. Huh. And, and uh, the bluebird day heel bales and I just don't want things breaking when, when I'm out there, you know? Yeah. Those are pretty durable bindings. There's not, there's a few things that can go wrong, but it usually takes a long, long time. <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's cool. Well, and then one set of skis, I'll like the Razzies that I, I'll use more powder skis but for powders in the East. What? I use two, two slick pins. I keep one in the first position and one in the second. No way. Really? Like a yeah. backup? A backup. Oh, interesting. If I go, if I go skinning, I'll take out the middle one, put that in my pocket, um, and just rely, and it's a little bit freer moving. Huh, that's um, kind of a cool trick. I never even thought about that. You just keep it, keep one plugged in in front of the other one as a backup, and if you end up losing one or whatever, it's already there. Oh, uh, undoubtedly you might lose one in the snow. Yeah. Huh. So, I like yeah. that. That's a, that's a, that's a slick trick. Hot. Hot, hot tip, uh-huh. hot tip from the East Coast. <laughs> I like it. Um, all right. Well, I want to. One of the things I told you I wanted to ask you about is is kind of, you know, you said eventually you end up at Bromley. Probably, I mean, it's not like you're stuck at one resort. But did you end up working at Bromley? Is that kind of what ended up happening to kind of? Because that's where I know you from. So I guess I just yeah. have it burned in my psyche that. You know, Greg's from Bromley. <laughs> like yeah. you've never gone anywhere else in your life or something. Yeah, so I this is my tenth year at Bromley. <clears throat> and I came by way of Bromley. I mean I would float in and out. Um but I was working with Dickie Hall for a while. Um went through one of his uh a couple of those instructor programs and and I started uh, and I always did a lot of NATO stuff as w- much as I could and um, but then there was an opportunity that to, to work at his uh, telefest at Mad River which was awesome and you know, I did that for a bunch of years and then he asked me if, if I would help him because he would travel around to different resorts and Bromley was one of them and asked if I would come help um, teach some of his weekend clinics so I started doing that and he introduced me to people at Bromley so that's kind of how I got into Bromley and met the general manager who was a telemark skier Um, he's still there and it's awesome that's what makes it all happen I love it there's we've got an insider that's good to know. <laughs> yeah, Bill Carnes. Yep, Bill Carnes from Bromley. GM on Telegear. Love I, it. I love that. I didn't realize. So okay, this is this is kind of making more sense. I didn't realize you and Dicky worked together, and you kind of. I mean, it makes it, it makes sense because you're like, oh yeah, I was going to Mad River and kind of that zone, and the, and yeah. the time frame for NATO. For those that don't know, we're not talking about like the international. Uh, organization we're talking about uh, the North American Telemark organization I believe is that right NATO North American Telemark organization I think that's yes. the right way that's right um, 
yeah so we we may i was asking you before we hopped on i feel like we've only known each other from emails but now i'm having the sneaking suspicion that we may have crossed paths at a nato festival at, at some point I, think you did. <laughs> I remember you there okay okay <laughs> i know Th- those are those festivals are those were wild man <laughs> yeah they're wild <laughs> I loved it. I, I uh, on and off the snow, they were wild. Yeah. Well, it was funny because uh, Wendy, that uh, has worked with Dickie a long time, who you probably know, she yeah. e- emailed me recently and said they're bringing back a not NATO, but they're they're putting a uh, a gathering together this year. Um, awesome. And including the third story dance party, which. Uh, <laughs> If you've been to a NATO festival, you probably know what what we're referring to. I, I, you kind of giggle. <laughs> You're like, I, I giggle, and I, I I'm probably going to be there for sure. <laughs> oh, for sure. I I literally I remember the first one. I think I I think I only made it to two, but I remember that opera party. Thinking, how is the floor supporting this many people dancing around? <laughs> uh, good times. Um, okay, so that. Oh yeah, go go ahead. So you went you went through some of that, and then uh, yeah. So um, my engineering world started to lighten up a little bit, and and uh, <clears throat> I had been doing that for a long, long time, and and I still do it on a, more on a part time basis. But but I've made to a point where I just wanted to do more of my own coaching work. Um, and this is, you know, shortly after Dickie has exposed me to the people at Bromley running clinics and introduced me to people. And it was like in 2012, I had, you know, more time on my hands and I was like, well, I'm going to give this ski instructor thing a, a, a better go and, you know, still do stuff with Dickie Hall, but it was an opportunity that opened up at Bromley to run their telemark school. And um, it's the Carrie Anderson telemark uh, school at Bromley. And if this is the guy that I took lessons with 28 years ago. That's, that's so cool. Tell, tell us a little bit about Corey, because this is a figure that I don't think I've talked about on the podcast but I feel like is a pretty significant figure in telemark, obviously at Bromley, but also on the East coast because, and and honestly, I, I'm the one time that I met him was at NATO festival and I can't remember if it was Dickie hall or somebody said, Hey, you need to meet this guy. Yeah. And I went and sat down. Funny enough. I think I actually recorded an interview and I don't, I don't know what, where it is. (laughs) So maybe I'll dig it up in the archives one day, but, uh, yeah, yeah, give us a little, whatever background you know, I, I, I think that he's a really important person that you just, you, especially people that are not in that zone probably have never even heard the name. Yeah. Well, I'll do my best because I really didn't know Corey um, personally. Um, so, yeah, I took a lesson with him. I knew the name. I knew he uh, was Norwegian and he brought Telemark back to Bromley because he grew up doing it. Um, So when I contacted Bromley, see if they need a Telemark instructor, when they said, yes, come on up for training and let's, let's get it going. I'm like, okay. But what happened, Corey had passed that, that fall. And that was in 2012. And they're like, okay, you're the new telemark guru, and and here you go. <laughs> I'm like, oh, okay. Um, so I didn't, I didn't really know him very well, but um, I had to really get in touch with the community that he built at, at uh, Bromley because it was very the telemark tradition is really strong at Bromley, and it's his doing, um, really. So I'm carrying a big torch um, at Bromley and keeping it all going and 
uh, revitalize the festival again, uh, help ramp it up to where it is now. We're at the 36th year of doing it now. Wow. And and did did Corey start that festival or was it the mountain and he was involved, I guess, because it's the, you guys call it the Corey Anderson Telemark Festival, I believe now, right? Uh, yes, it always has been called that. Okay. Um, it was a private event for many, many years. It was about you know, 10 years ago when they decided to make it a mountain event. Uh, but they still carry the name. <clears throat> and, uh, you know, it's because the general manager is a telemark skier and he has a passion for it as well. And it just allows it to keep going. Because it's a big, it's a tradition at Bromley. Yeah, that's amazing. So, that's yeah, that's amazing. Thirty six years is legit too. There's not a lot of festivals that are left, and obviously, um, yeah, you know NATO. I mean, it it went forty years. You guys are yeah. you guys are closing in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, it's so I'm on staff all all winter. Yeah, you know, I'll more part time staff. I'll work the weekends and holidays and and people seek out telemark construction and privates and stuff and you know, I've carried over some of what NATO would come and do at, at Bromley. So I've built similar uh workshops and clinics that happen three or four times a season for a weekend. But that's you know, that's still some of the old you know, the NATO style of running a a workshop. At Bromley, so I'm still carrying that uh, tradition. Um, it's you know, yeah, yeah. Well, it, no, and I love that, and I I think just the fact that um, you guys are doing workshops. There's not as I mean, you think back like when NATO was in its heyday, or um, you guys had NET New England Telemark at one point. There was kind of like the dueling you know, <laughs> clinics and, you know, whatnot. And, and same out West, there was all these different organizations that were doing a women's clinic or steep skiing clinic or learn to tell or whatever. And it's, it's interesting. I, I really hope people hear this and, and, you know, find, find ways locally to do that. Cause I mean, obviously it, it helps carry that tradition on when people can access it and get instruction and uh i think t- tell me if i'm wrong i feel like you guys actually are one of the few places that has a telemark rental available at the mountain am i correct with that i can't remember yeah. <laughs> yep you are correct um so Corey, that's something that Corey had built and uh he, he with his own money he would um you know buy gear he had connections with um garma at that time and and um, it, it just you know built up a good range of gear, although it was lighter, seventy-five millimeter. Um, like when I arrived, it was a lot of lighter stuff. It was plastic boots, like you know crispy boots and gumma boots and stuff, um, which are all still there. <clears throat> and there was a handful of uh, NTN early NTN boots. In bindings and skis, that's that set up. Um, but I haven't fully embraced the NTN world yet, only because I can pretty much do everything on what I'm doing now. Um, they might have more edge control on ice, but but um, I can still manage pretty darn good. Do you, Do you think are most of the people? Uh yeah, and that's cool too. I mean, it's kind of like we always say, like it's not <laughs> for 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 some weird reason. It's become this like NTN versus seventy five millimeter, like you're in a boxing match or something, you know. And it's kind of <laughs> silly and weird, but um, yeah. but I'm curious. So do you do you find like the uh, like the majority of Telemark skiers that are coming to Bromley are, are kind of still revolving around seventy five millimeter, just because like that's kind of what they're like you said when you go to a certain mountain you kind of pick up what people are on and then you just kind of stick with it or do you guys are you guys kind of half and half these days um so there's a lot of people a lot of tele skiers that come to bromley to be around other tele skiers 
you know, Bromley has a big community of telemark skiers. And it's a pretty old community. And and I would say, you know, to 70%, 75 millimeters still. And and, uh, and the balance is, is NTM. A lot of newer people coming in um, that come through programs and things are pretty much all on NTM right now. Um, I think that's just what's available on the market to buy. You know, there's not, a, there's just a handful of 75 millimeter equipment left. That's still new. There's no more um, research and development going into that world at the moment. Yeah. There's some, there's some, but, but uh, the most robust bindings are, are the ones that are still out there and, and working and performing. Yeah. It's kind of like, like you said, you're on a vice most of the time. It's like, I mean, to, yeah. it's like in, you know, for sometimes I'll call that the pinnacle of 75 millimeter. <laughs> yeah. I'd say it's at the, probably the top of its game. Yeah. It's pretty close. I mean, the fact that you've got, it's pretty indestructible. It's uh very, it's just kind of industrial design. Like you've got the slick pin, like we were talking about, you can change your pivot point, you can change your springs. Um, it sizes down to a small or super large boots. I guess, I guess you have a small or a large, actually that brings up a good question. Cause I, I believe you have a kid's program too, don't you? Or you have in the past. Am I well, we have, that is one of my projects that I keep pushing for. Yeah. Um, but we do have smaller, uh, kids telemark rental gear. And it is 75 millimeter. Yep. The, and that's yeah, because the NTN is too hard for a young one to, to bend. Yeah. I a hundred percent, hundred percent agree with that. Actually, did you know that 22 designs, did you see the, uh, they're actually putting out small bindings with a softer spring specifically. They're like, they're touting it as like a junior binding this year. Um, uh, no, but uh, but I I have been sourcing uh, a lot of things gear at App Bromley. Yeah, and to spruce up and keep refreshing our rental program, and that's what we do with the raffle monies at the um, at the festival. We raffle off all this gear and everything. We take that money and we bring it. We each year we just buy more gear for the um, for the rental program and it just keeps it up to date it just keeps it fresh and uh, and that's that's putting money back into the program so that that's how we keep that uh, the rental gear fresh yeah that's awesome well I I, I applaud you for uh for putting the kids program together too. That's something it's uh it's cool that that's on your radar. Cause I feel like we, we, I think in the back of our heads, we all know <laughs> like we can talk about clinics and all this, but it, yeah, if we don't have younger kids, you know, learning how to do this, it's eventually we're all going to age out, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> not be around any longer. So, uh, so what happens at Bromley with the community that's there? Is um, it's, a, it's a big family mountain, and I'd say it's like a level two PSIA level two kind of mountain. Um, you got bumps, you got it's a southern facing mountain, so it's a great place in the spring for bump skiing. Yeah, a lot of good blue blue terrain, some green, and there's some pretty aggressive blacks, double diamonds, and the tree skiing is phenomenal. Good old New England birch, pine tree tight woods not as tight as mad river but a little more flowier than mad river uh, but it's really good and it's good it's really really good yeah was, um so there's a lot to do at bromley on telly that's what that's what the the community thrives on but we do have kids programs at bromley they have a jets program and primarily they're all alpine skiers and they're snowboarders 
<clears throat> young kids. It's like long-term student development stuff. And I would love to have the whole Telemark group, but they're not quite there yet. But the great thing is twice a season, they have a switch day. So they could switch to a different different discipline. And they all, well, these kids all choose Telemark because <laughs> they want to do it. Because they see everybody else doing it on the mountain. And why aren't they doing it? They see their dad and their mom skiing on Tele Gear. They want to do it too. <clears throat> so because of that, you get the young ones out there trying it, messing about. They love it. And then, you know, mom and dad buy them Tele Gear for Christmas or something, and off they go. And they don't want to go back. <laughs> I love that. So yeah. that's really good. <clears throat> Yeah, that's why I was excited to talk to you about it because it's uh, just talk to you in general because it's like you you are one of the few places that's kind of got, in my opinion, sort of the recipe uh, for success. And and I'll 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 uh, I'll add in that uh, it takes a lot of people <laughs> and a lot of time to get some of this stuff going and continue it because. I mean, yeah, anybody who knows that's putting on events or organizing rental gear or, I mean, it takes a lot of time and effort. So sh- big shout out to you for that. But yeah, you guys, <laughs> someone needs to pat people on the back like you <laughs> yeah. and the GM for letting it happen, you know? So it's, um, yeah, it takes a lot of time. But, but I guess what I mean by that recipe is like, you know, you said it's like kids see parents or other people on the on the hill and it makes them want to do it and you kind of have the attention span is not going to last forever so you got to have equipment for them which you guys have you know and and this goes for adults too and on top of that then you have the sense of community like there's an event that happens every year you know and there's workshops for people to improve their skills at different levels and you got a great mountain like you said that's diverse it's not you know, one boring run. It's, you know, like you said, you could, uh, you know, moguls, you could do a mogul clinic. Uh, you can catch up with some friends and do that. So I just, I just wanted to point that out. Cause I think that is one of the cool things about what you guys have going on there that I definitely see from the outside and I'm like, Oh, okay. This is, it's not easy to put all that together, you know? And I'm sure you feel that too. It's like, you don't want to let any piece it's it's like you're juggling all these balls to try to keep <laughs> telemark growing in that area you know but it's i think it's uh it's it's definitely worth mentioning it took a long time to get there i'm sure yeah um so you know cory helped build this uh community at plumley and there's other really um talented um whether they're psia or they they decided more to nato on the, the workings of the the, co- the coaching philosophy, if you will, and <clears throat> but there's some really key players at Bromley that are, are used to teach at Bromley for Bromley and used to teach Kelly, but now they're still there. But they bring a lot of people, you know, back to the mountain each year because they're there. You know, you got people like Jeb Porter, uh, Rudy McClugger. Um, we got visiting coaches that come in that I bring in for the Telefest. Um, so, so yeah, I'm there. So I'm just a conduit to keep feeding this community um, as I grow in my skill and my coaching knowledge of teleskiing. Um, you know, I'm the gear is changing, right? We're no longer mechanically placing the skis to make a turn like we were on the lighter gear. Now we can start steering our skis with the heavier, with the gear that we're on now and NTN, NTN, NTN. So it's a different style of skiing and there's different techniques and tactics that you need to use. But that's the stuff that I'm bringing in um, with my involvement with the PSIA now. Um, I'm a level three and a, I'm on the DCL education staff and I keep working my way up. Um, 
although it's hard sometimes because I have some old rooted style in me. <laughs> but, I, uh, I was, I was, I was going to ask you, okay, so you're level three PSIA and, and I'll, I'll preface this by saying that I still have not gotten Dickie Hall on here. Um, I'm trying to dig him out of the backwoods of wherever he's at. <laughs> he's, he's, hard, still, he's still in, in Vermont. <laughs> no, I know. I know he and I text back and forth and I'm always like, come on, dude, do the podcast. But, um, we'll, we'll get him on here, but I'm curious. You, as far as I, I understand is NATO kind of had its own philosophy, right? Like of teaching and it was not PSIA. So it's, I'm interested, like, is, is it what, what, I mean, and I know this was a long time ago, you were doing like instructor courses and all that. Do you ever find that there's maybe, like you said, there's some kind of hard habits or, or were there kind of some good things that you learn, like, working through the NATO programs way back in the day that like kind of help you now when you're teaching people or has PSI kind of figured it all out and it's sort of all in that, that vein at this point. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I would say yeah, this, this is a touchy top topic, but um, so I'm also, <laughs> I don't want to, I don't want to get I'm you in trouble. A, dude. <laughs> a paddle sports coach. I teach sea kayaking. I have a whole business doing that. And you know, I got a lot of my coaching knowledge from British canoeing, and that means going to Europe, going to the UK <clears throat> most of the summer, and just working on my international coaching credentials. So that philosophy and that organization is really, really student centered, and um, and uh, it's not about the coach dictating or instructing um, what people need to do off a checklist. And NATO was really, really close to that. It was very organic and it was experimental and it was guided discovery and you know, guided discovery with a little more with a focus. Um, but it was about, about the learner, about the performer. And it wasn't about the coach or the instructor. That's an that's a really interesting description of it. <laughs> no, that's no, that's that totally that makes so much more sense the way that you explain that. Because I always like wondered looking out outside looking in because I never actually went to a NATO w- workshop, you know. So I was I'm I'm curious. And, and so you're saying, like I said, I don't want to get you in any trouble here. <laughs> <laughs> but uh psia is is because that's what psia that's what always worried me like you know especially when i was younger i taught in ski schools here and there but it's when it came to telemark i it, i i i probably would have vibed more with the nato thing like this discovery and everybody's got their own style and psia always seemed more rigid like it's like this is how the turn looks and i'm like nah i don't think so <laughs> so i'm always well, curious you know, on a positive note, it is changing, and it is changing fast in the PSIA. Um, I think a lot has to do with how when the PSIA goes to these international competitions um, and they start working with the other countries, especially on the telemark and also on the, on the down, all the other disciplines too, you start getting ideas, international ideas on how the other countries do things and because there's a lot of coaching science that comes out of Europe, um, more so than in America, um, and it goes, that coaching science goes into the Olympic level. But say in the paddle sports world, say in the UK, that Olympic level is, is they're serious about winning the Olympics for paddling. And, and we are too, but you don't really know it. But you know it over there. But that trickles down to from the uh, um, Olympic level coaches, then it goes into the recreational performance coaches, and all the way down. So it trickles down fast that coaching um, knowledge. Um, that's happening more and more in PSIA, and I, I think it's a really great thing because they're changing. And 
Um, I, you know, I had some resistance when I first started um, chasing these uh, personal performance awards in the PSIA telemark. But, you know, I stuck with it and I changed as they changed. And it's made me a better skier. It's, um, you know, I still, I still carry all my, my bag of tricks when I'm working with people. You have to individually coach everybody while you're doing one task. Hmm. That, that's coaching. That's not instructing. Yeah. Instructing would be making everybody look the same. Yeah, cookie cutter the cookie cutter the whole thing and that's cool that you have the other business and and international experience too because that is one of the most interesting things that it is as i've talked to people that you know they're professional like they're they're maybe the equivalent of full-time ski instructors here but they're literally traveling around like they got degrees i interviewed someone the other day that was uh, on the podcast that was like they actually have like a degree <laughs> that they got for, you know, being a snow sports professional and then they're traveling all around and teaching in all these different schools and different countries. And yeah, it seems like, and you know, and I think with telly, it's like, you know, uh, like Scotty McGee put together like the, uh, uh, inter telly thing where it's bringing people together specifically from all the different countries and stuff. I, yeah, I, I agree. You know, you get a lot of different that flavors. Yep. For sure. <laughs> I think that's really great. Have you been Have you been to one of those before? No, but I, I want to go back to Panorama. It's at Panorama this March. Yep. Yeah, I know. I I <laughs> I got to meet a couple people. This was a while back. Honestly, it was probably when you started at Bromley. It might have even been that long ago, 2012. Yeah, maybe 2014. There was one at Snowbird, but I, I remember a lot of the East Coast guys, Mickey Stone, you know, and a lot of those cats came back from the East Coast and... Um, yeah, it's always fun just to see, see how, how everybody skis and does things differently. And, um, yeah, that's cool to hear that, that it's evolving continually too, from your perspective. Yeah, it's good. It's been good for me to do it and, um, be a part of that whole process. And, you know, it's just making me a better performer and a better, uh, instructor. Yeah, I love it. Well, um, yeah, before we sign off, like, tell me, uh, do you guys have a date for the festival this year already lined out? Yeah, it's the same time as it is every year. It's at the end of the president's holiday week. So it's February 26th to the 27th, two days. Um, we got uh, clinics happening morning and afternoon on <clears throat> Saturday. And and uh, Sunday morning is the famed uh, Telemark race. 10 GS turns, jump, 10 more GS turns, Rapalusha, about five to eight skating gates to the finish. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah. You, got, you got a full classic going. I like it. It's great. Um, yeah. And then, so that's what it is. And, and well, so is all the info is it uh, is it all on Bromley site generally like once things are up and running yeah it's not, it's up there now it's on the calendar of events it's just marking the time a little bit of description but <clears throat> all the registration stuff's not up yet but. okay I'll, I'll make sure to put a link to to that zone so people can at least keep track and That's as it cool. get, as it gets closer um and I'll make sure to put it put it on my calendar too cuz I've been trying to trying to get some of these events out on the on the introductions and stuff keep everybody up to date with a uh, where to head for the weekend if there's some tele action going on yeah but you know we had uh, telemark down comes there and they set up with all the demos it has got you know live demos always happening that you could do and um variety of clinics and the challenge is bringing in the instructors that want to do this yeah right just so i have a whole network of people that i know all through vermont people that i enjoy i like their style i like their style of teaching and um and 
yeah, and they all love coming. It's some of the best the best weekend they have of the of the season. I love that. So you got a lot of uh, the variety of coaches, which is really fun. Yeah, well, that's that's what always makes it is is uh, well, I think just telemark coming together on those weekends. I mean, it's fun to see everybody's style and and obviously in the coaching context of it too. Just getting the opportunity to ski with people that have a different way of doing things, you know. So, yeah. Well, cool, man. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I'm I'm psyched that we got to chop it up a little bit on the podcast and and get to know more about uh, what you're doing to carry the torch on at Bromley. And like I said, uh, pat on the back, congratulations for doing all this, man. And, and I know there's other people behind the scenes too. So, um, you know, we want to wish you all the best and, and, uh, keep us in the loop as, as things are happening and, and yeah, we'll, uh, we'll keep trying to get people to head your way and take some workshops. So, yeah, I want to try to get out your way this one. Anytime, man. Come by the right. shop and we'll, we'll we'll go skiing with you for sure. Oh, that's awesome. Awesome, man. All right. Thanks a lot for coming on, man. We'll talk to you soon. Okay. Take care. Bye. Well, big thanks to Greg for coming on and talking to us a little bit about what's going on at Bromley, sort of his telemark personal history, kind of how he got into it, uh, his involvement with PSIA, Super interesting conversation, and like I said, one of the things I really like about what he has going on in Vermont there at Bromley is sort of this recipe for success if you want to grow Telemark. You know, you've got to have equipment, you got to have local support from the hill that you're skiing at, um, kids program, uh, Telemark clinics, instruction. I just love it, and uh, really happy that I was able to get him on the podcast. I think he that's a... Uh, a very important conversation just to kind of see, uh, like I always say, what other people are doing that's successful in the area. They want to share Telemark skiing. They want to share the turn. They want to pass it on to other people. You know, they want to spread Telemark as, as we always say. Uh, but sometimes, you know, it's like, where do you start? And I think this is a really good model for what you should shoot for and then what pieces you can maybe put into place to get things rolling. And also the festival, obviously. And uh, much respect for Corey Anderson and all the groundwork that he laid uh, leading into this, you know, almost four decades ago. And that's what it takes. It takes a, a community of people that want to protect the turn, pass it on, and keep it going. And uh, that's what I'm all about. And I, I know Greg's all about that. And Corey was all about that. And so many of you out there are all about that. So that's what it's all about. It's uh it's about the community and about protecting the turn and keeping it rolling. So if you want to protect the turn more and know what's going on, be sure to sign up for the mailing list. Link is in the show notes. As always, get a weekly email. It's going to have some stuff from uh, Free Hill Life Retail Store, what we're up to, news and events, uh, as well as uh, links to all of our social media, new videos that are out. Uh, including uh, Dossie's View, The Lowdown, and uh, also stuff from the magazine. So we'd love for you to check that out. As always, we want to be your preferred telemark shop. You can find us at freeheallife.com. Uh, you can also come to our retail store in Salt Lake City. Many people I know are traveling uh, this time of year uh, using their various passes to come out to Utah. We'd love to see you. We're not open on Sundays and Mondays, but you can find us Tuesday through Friday, noon until 7 p.m., Saturdays, 10 a.m. until 7 p.m., and it would be fantastic to see you, get to know you, get to know your Telemark story, and help you out uh, with your Telemark needs. So be sure to do that. If you need to get a hold of the team, you can always do that, Customer service at freehealife.com. On the other side of the Free Hill Life world, we've got Telemark Skier Magazine, you can find that at telemarksgear.com for articles, gear reviews, and more. And you can become a premium subscriber for additional content. We always love to have you on that side of the house as well. And if you want to get a hold of me, ideas for the podcast, 
you like something, you you heard an error that needs to be fixed, whatever it may be. I always love hearing from you. Podcast at freehealthlife.com. And thanks for listening. Uh, if you are an Apple listener, please take a moment, rate and review the podcast. Uh, I always love reading those. It helps us kind of get up in the ratings for people to find us there. Uh, if you're on other platforms, just share it with your friends. And until next week, spread telemark always.